Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, we're about to start our empty chair town hall for Congressman John Sasso. Um, I would ask that everybody just uh, quiet down the side conversations and we'll get started. Um, so my name is Nicole Carvalho. I am the uh, Public Affairs and Volunteer Coordinator from Upper Hudson Planned Parenthood. Um, we have coordinated today with Chatham Indivisible, uh, Indivisible 19, uh, Rensselaer County Indivisible, uh, so many groups that have been really supportive in our work. Um, I just want to thank all of you for coming out to support us, to support them. Um, and if we could have the first uh, question from the audience, I would really appreciate that. Hello, Congressman Faso. My name is Bob Clark. I live in Valencia, just down the road. And um, I'd like to know how you respond to concerns of your constituents that the President Trump's AHCA passed by the Congress uh, endangers access for, to health insurance for millions of people. So the question for the Congressman was, how do you respond to concerns of your constituents that President Trump's American Health Care Act, as passed by the Congress, endangers access to health insurance for millions of people. So my name is Maureen Wilson. I am from Spencertown. We have heard your response. And after carefully researching the facts with sources such as the Congressional Budget Office report, the Kaiser Foundation newsletter, and others, this is what we understand to be the responsible reply. These are some examples of the way insurance under Trump Care would work. Here in New York, for example, starting in 2019, insurers would charge more for older people in order to entice younger, healthier people to sign up. And there would be dramatic changes possible in what is excluded from coverage in states that obtain waivers. Essential benefits now covered under Obamacare such as maternity care, mental health, and rehabilitation could therefore not be covered. Also, Trump Care would allow premiums to be based on an individual's health status. Over time, this means it will become more difficult for people with pre-existing <laughs> conditions to afford insurance. Yeah. And people insured under Medicaid and those who are still uninsured will face much greater changes. The result of these changes would mean that the number of uninsured would rise from 14 million at the inception to as many as 51 million in total by 2026. Again, my statements are based on the Congressional Budget Office report dated May 24, 2017 on House, Republican, House Bill 1628 the House version of Trump Care. This is Duke, the protest dog, by the way. Uh, I would ask Mr. Fassett to respond to today's article in the Register Star, and it's by a Dr. Atkins, who is a local physician. And if you haven't read it, I made copies. It is terrific. And I'd like Mr. Fasso to, do, to uh, respond to each of the issues that he raises, and, in, and he does say that what Fassel's statement was in this paper was either con he was either confused or intended to confuse. Now, you can make up your mind what it is, it doesn't make any difference, but it's another set of alternate facts, and he sets them straight, and he is a physician involved in Medicare, Medicaid, the whole works, and can explain it. I would only add one more thing which is not in here. We hear about cuts in Medicaid, and everybody says that well, something for poor people, it doesn't apply to us. That's not true. We would not have nursing homes without Medicaid. And many of us have to plan around somehow getting nursing care. And 90% of our nursing homes are supported by Medicaid for the elderly. I believe it's 60% of the Medicaid budget. What's going to happen with the billion dollars in cuts that he, Faso passed. So I would like to have Mr. Faso make a response 
point by point of all the legitimate questions that were raised by Dr. Atkins. And if anyone wants copies, I made copies of this article if you don't get to register yourself. Hello. Based on what you just heard, uh, let me just introduce myself. My name is Barbara Nagler, and I live in Old Chatham, and I've been there for 37 years. Uh, my question is also about Medicaid. I'm worried that the program is going to disappear, and I'm wondering how people who can't afford premiums without subsidy will manage to get health care. Um, so my question is actually, will Medicare remain an entitlement program for all who need it? I was never clear about your answer, Congressman Faso. I'm Brenda Geberts from Ghent. And because there are so many provisos as you describe the program under Trump Care, here is the answer based on careful research. Again, the short answer is no. Trump Care tampers with Medicaid coverage by cutting $97 billion a year from the program. States would have to ration care and cut the quality of services. The Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation says that in order to make up for reductions in federal funds, states will have to raise taxes and cut funding to education. Thank you for responding for the Congressman. Question three. Can you describe the specific ways access to Medicaid changes? What programs for the disabled will be curtailed? What programs for the elderly? Well, thank you for asking that question, and I guess I'm going to have to speak for Mr. Fazzo, who's noticeably absent. Medicaid covers 39% of children nationwide. Of the children, almost half have special health care needs. Nearly 50% of funds provide care for the elderly and the disabled. Federal cutbacks would likely reduce eligibility and cutbacks in services. Trump Care. The Republican leadership's plan to repeal and replace Obamacare would cap federal funding for Medicaid for the first time in the program's history, putting Medicaid coverage at risk for millions of low-income people. While the Medicaid program could be strengthened and improved, limiting the scope of Medicaid is likely to jeopardize access to care for the population most in need, with adverse consequences for their health and well-being. And what does cutting aid to the most needy say about our country's commitment to care for every citizen? Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Good evening, Congressman. My name is Jennifer Clark, and I have lived in Columbia County for the last 50 odd years. Voted here for 34. Understanding how insurance works for people with pre-existing conditions is certainly a challenge. Under Obamacare, pre-existing conditions are covered. Period. Does the proposed Trump Care similarly guarantee such coverage? In the absence of the Congressman, I'm Lisa Footner from Spencertown. I think I'm loud enough. Can everyone hear me? I think you're loud enough, too. I'm loud. And the answer is no. The guarantee disappears. And here's how the ACHA, otherwise known as Trump Care, is challenging for sick people. Although the ACHA would still require insurers to offer coverage to everyone, including people who have pre-existing conditions, such as diabetes, asthma, pregnancy, acne, or even cancer, it would allow states to opt out of the present federal law, that is the prohibition against charging sick people more than healthy ones. The bill opens the door for insurers to set rates for people based on their health. For example, if you have no pre-existing health condition, you would be offered a discounted premium. If you have a pre-existing condition, you're going to be put in a high-risk pool and charged much, much more. That way. Hi, I'm Alan Gelb. I've lived in East Chatham for 30-odd years. Uh, my question has to do with the high-risk pools. Uh, can you explain what is a high-risk pool? Will the existence of these pools provide affordable insurance for people with pre-existing conditions? How do they work? Well, since the congressman has, from time to time, relied on the existence of high-risk pools as an uh, answer to the problem of people with pre-existing conditions, and such a pool is an insurance pool designed for people who are very sick or who have pre-existing conditions. Obviously, the premiums under such a pool will be extremely high unless they are offset by government subsidies. 
before Obamacare, states that tried to impose these routinely did not provide enough subsidies, and either the premiums were sky high, there were, was only a very small number of people who, who could get into the program, or the coverage was not good coverage. Republicans claim that they've solved this problem by setting aside $138 billion over 10 years for this purpose. The problem is twofold. The, that's about half the amount that most independent uh, students, including conservatives from the American Enterprise Institute, have said would be necessary. Um, so, so even if that were true, there's not enough money. And second of all, um, it's not true. Um, that set aside part isn't the case. Much of that money has already been designated for um, maternity care, uh, mental health care, um, substance abuse care, and other premium, general premium discounts, not, not directed to pre people with pre-existing conditions. So there's only about $8 billion, or less than a billion per year, that they've really set aside. And it will be just simply inadequate to fund uh, high-risk pools. Thank you for our answering in place of the Congressman. Question four. My name is Bruce Burns. I'm from Austerlitz. What happens to the status of Planned Parenthood clinics and services under Trump Care? I'm, I'm, I'm in. You're for Planned a. Planned Parenthood would be prevented from serving Medicaid patients. The proposed law, as written, specifically excludes Planned Parenthood from being a provider of services to its patients on Medicaid. For almost half of women on Medicaid, Planned Parenthood is their only source of health care. They rely on Planned Parenthood for cancer screenings, contraception services, testing for sexually transmitted diseases, counseling and education about contraceptive choices. The only funds that come to Planned Parenthood now under Obamacare are payments for services it for its Medicaid patients. Absolutely no grants, no other payments, only payments for services. Planned Parenthood is one of the nation's leading providers of high quality, affordable health care for women, men, young people, and the nation's largest provider of sex education. The information about the exclusion of Planned Parenthood as a provider is based on the provisions of the American Health Care Act, that is, Trump Care. I'm Joan Bloomberg, and I live in Old Chatham, where we've lived for 49 years. Well, where are people to go to get the services they now get from Planned Parenthood? I understand there are federal clinics. Where are they, and how many of them are there? And are there enough federal health clinics to offer services to women seeking contraceptive care? The answer is no. Federally health clinics do not have the capacity to take on the patients that currently come from Planned Parenthood for contraceptive services. 85% of Planned Parenthood's contraceptive clients, which is 1.7 million, are in the 333 county, counties where, I don't know what this word means, but I voted for it anyway, FQHC sites would have to at least double their capacity to provide these services, or where there are currently no whatever this thing means, sites, federally funded health care clinics, sites providing this, people would be without service. So again, we want to thank everybody for coming out this afternoon. Um, I have copies of all of the questions that we've asked and the factually based responses that we have to those questions. Um, if you'd like to come and see me afterwards, I'd be happy to provide you with all of that information. Um, a partial list of the sources that we turn to to provide facts about the proposed law to replace Obamacare were the Kaiser Family Foundation, kff.org, 10 Things to Know About Medicaid, Setting the Facts Straight, published May 9, 2017, 
Medicaid restructuring under the AHCA and non-elderly adults with disabilities, published on March 16, 2017. Implications of reduced federal Medicaid funds and how could states fill the funding gap, published on March 22, 2017. Medicaid and children with special health care needs, published January 31, 2017 and the Congressional Budget Office Cost Estimate of H.R. 1628, the American Health Care Act of 2017, published May 24, 2017. Thank you all again for coming out today. We really appreciate it.